for the one or two people here today who do not already know this man, <laughs> Reverend Scott Shell has returned from the mountains to grace us with his presence and his message today. And he shepherded this group and guided and coached us for 17 years. Thank you, Scott. I'm wearing my name tag today <laughs> because you may remember last time I was here, it said the old minister. <laughs> now it says Ms. Minister Emeritus. Much better, right? <laughs> so I have the treat today to continue a series that Sue has been doing on the five invitations not a consecutive series. I think she's been peppering it through the year. I love, oh, by the way, and I won't be saying this name. I'm probably going to bastardize this name, and I will not be saying it again during the talk, but it's by Frank Ostaseski, something like that. I'll be referring to him as Frank. <laughs> the, the subtitle of this book is Discovering What Death Can Teach Us About Living Fully. And I love this. There's a, a wonderful African proverb that says, when death finds you, may it find you alive. <laughs> really important. Because you see, we, we come forward with so much stuff that tells us we can't or that we have to live a certain way or whatever, that we're not really open to what life is offering us in the moment. So what's, what have you guys looked at so far? Oh, let me also say one thing. So, and there may be more of you in the room, but Betty Hauserman and I participated in a eight-day death retreat this summer. It was powerful more powerful than I ever could have imagined. But one thing that really stuck with me that the presenter emphasized is that while we're here on this planet in an earthly human experience, we have the greatest opportunity to work with issues in our consciousness because we have a body, because we have hands and feet, because we're interacting with other people. It's not that growth of our consciousness ends when we die. Remember, consciousness is the only thing that goes on with us when we die. It's not that it stops growing, but it can be much harder to discover what it is in our consciousness that is holding us back because we don't have that same kind of interaction that we have here. It's not mirrored to us <laughs> by our relationships or you know, whatever else is going on in our lives. So again, when he says that, that using death to really inspire us to live our life fully, it's a great opportunity that we have here, not something to be postponed. So what have you guys covered so far? There are three invitations the first one, by the way, the book is The Five Invitations, so you've covered three. Don't wait. Welcome everything. Push away nothing. Bring your whole self to the experience. And then today, we're handling find a place of rest in the middle of things. You know, what's interesting about rest is most of us would say that we welcome rest. As you get older, it's harder to rest. <laughs> I'm finding harder to sleep a whole night. But what's interesting is while we'll speak that we welcome rest, that we're ready for rest, unconsciously, most of us resist rest, especially in a culture like ours. You know, our country is nicknamed, just do it. You know, or pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can make it happen in your life. And as a result, we often build our identities around being busy. Busyness says we're somebody, says we're important, says that we're needed. Busyness says that we have a purpose. It helps to 
compensate for insecurities that we may be feeling inside. And so the truth is, it's much harder to really rest. And when we say rest, we're not so much talking about laying down for the night and sleeping. We're talking about a rest that comes to us at an emotional level and at the level of, yeah, our nervous system, an emotional level, really being able to relax. Why is it important that we relax? Our nervous system is designed to charge up when it needs to and then to fully relax. But if we're always busy and also if we always have a plethora of stimulus in our life, our nervous system doesn't get to fully relax. And that then impacts our musculature, it impacts our, our mental health. We don't live a particularly good life when we can't rest. I have so many quotes that I always think I should kind of be looking down to see if I've already missed one. Here's something that Frank says, <laughs> giving us an indication into what it means to rest. If we want to experience true rest, we need to see the situations that disrupt us. Yet recognition is only the beginning. To make real change, we have to dive deeper to understand the specific ways that we have been conditioned throughout our lives. Then we can address the underlying, underlying causes of our internal distress or lack of restfulness. So here's where we're getting into the rub of it. We can't just say, okay, Scott talked about rest today, I'm gonna go home. I'm dedicated to rest now. Because what are we doing there? We're just doing more efforting. Okay, I'm going to effort to rest now. <laughs> and what Frank is beautifully pointing out is, if we're having trouble resting, then there is something in our unconscious that needs to be addressed. Some hurt, something that, uh, let's see, unhealed, some hurt, some you know, something that just won't let us settle, that needs to be looked at. And often it's good to understand that that unrest, if it's not addressed, can often manifest as a voice inside of our heads that's feeding us with ideas about how we're unworthy or we can't do it, things that are limiting our ability to really be the fullness of what's possible in our lives. So let's take a look at some of the things then that can support us. Oh, and another important piece, all we really need to do from Frank's standpoint, and I don't disagree, is learn to live in the moment. The moment is always revealing. <laughs> And most of us don't really want that revelation, so we, our egos keep us thinking about the past, wondering about the future, but not really landing in the moment. So what are then the things that we can do in our lives to begin to orient ourselves to hanging out in the moment? And one of those is to develop a daily practice or daily practices that bring you back to the moment. For example, when I was younger in my spiritual path and working with a teacher, the teacher encouraged me to get one of those watches that beeps. I still haven't figured out if you can make our new fangled watches do it, but I can't remember if it beeped every hour or every 30 minutes. But every time it beeped, I just paused. Now, I might even be in a phone call, right? And you can still be engaged in a phone call, but pause for a second and check out, where are you? Can you feel your butt in the chair? Or are you off in your head somewhere? Are you full of anxiety and fear because of something that's going on? Or are you feeling deficient or inadequate? Where are you? 
And if you can come back, often in taking that breath, right? Let's take a breath now. Ah, yeah. It brings us back into the moment. And here's what I found fascinating. After several months, I mean several months of that happening, I began to recognize that if I was going to stay present to the moment, I couldn't multitask, that there was no multitasking in the moment. I also began to trust the moment more because more and more things were getting done during the day than I ever imagined. The other piece that was fascinating was that I started, so I had my own little business at that time. I started actually turning away business. It became clearer to me what was mine to do and what was not mine to do. All of it from what? Being in the moment which opens us up to the resources of who and what we are as a spiritual being. And spirit is all-knowing, all-compassionate, all-understanding. And so my ego is thinking that, ah, I need to produce and do and be efficient. and, And actually, as I oriented to the moment, spirit was doing the work. It's the Christ within that does the work. Another quote. Rest is found when we are present instead of letting our minds wander aimlessly through the hallways of fear, worry, and anxiousness. Rest comes when we become more, when we become more by doing less, when we don't allow the urgent to crowd out the important, It's a result of decluttering of the mind and decoupling from fixed views. Rest is Sabbath. When we stop and turn to worship the possibilities of the ever fresh moment. I love that. And can you feel the rest in that? And so breathing is another important practice. Breathing does so many things. When we take a breath, we interrupt that narrative that's going on or the story that we're telling ourselves. We can also really focus on breath. For example, when I broke my ankle several years ago, I was, we were in Estes Park. It was a snowy night. There was no one around. I was laying on the ground for at least 30 minutes, maybe 40, freezing and in incredible pain. And I started to think, I'm not sure I'm going to survive this. And then I started to breathe and just focused on nothing but the breath, in and out, and the pause at the end of it. And before I knew it, there's a car driving by. And I'm you know, laying on the ground, but waving my hands like a snowman, because it's snowing like crazy. <laughs> then they went and got uh, the men. And one of the presenters is, I'm a teacher in the Ridwan School. He and I turned out years later to be in the same seminary class. But intuitively, he brought his face right to my face. And he said, breathe with me. And that, you know, it was okay to breathe by myself, but when someone else is willing to breathe with you. Because it took another 15 minutes for the paramedics to get there. It kind of blew my mind. So, you know, if you're one of those people that thinks, well, I don't want to get in someone's space. Uh, I don't know. (laughs) Trust. See, a big thing about resting is we're coming to trust, right? Because the ego's going to say, stay busy, stay busy. You got to... It's all about trusting. 
So if someone's hurting, come in close. If they're struggling, encourage them to breathe. Stuart and I are having some work done on our house. We have log railings around our house and some of them are rotting and so we're having some new railings put in and the crew that's doing it is struggling with a stairway i don't know i think three crews have been out now that we were we're working with a contractor that has lots of crews he said they've done logs before (laughs) and in fact I should have brought a picture. It it looks pretty good on the straightaways, but the stairway, every time I go out there, it's shoddy. And I went out. This last team told me, no, no, we've got it, you know. So I said, okay. I went out. Ugh. (laughs) And I felt a lot of frustration. And, you know, frustration is anger. It's just... Toned down maybe a little bit, but. (laughs) So I looked at it and I start marching back into the house and I catch myself, I go, oh wait, I'm feeling anger here. And anger most often is covering up something that we don't want to feel. Because see, anger's outward. Damn them. (laughs) So I took a breath. That's the beauty of a breath, right? It breaks the cycle of the ego, of the patterning that we have in our reactivity or in our hurt. Take a breath. And I reminded myself, okay, if anger is covering something up, what is it? And I could start as I was walking, feeling the helplessness. I stayed with the helplessness for a while because I didn't feel like there was much I could do. And then... I had this wild memory of my childhood. I was a kid that loved the yard. So, I mean, kind of, I should have been in the Guinness World Book of Records because I was the kid that said, I'll do the yard. (laughs) I loved the yard. But occasionally, you know, mowers break down or you run out of gas or whatever. And my parents were, um, what would you say, not very invested (laughs) in supporting me in doing that. So the mower could be broken for three weeks. And as I felt that, my heart started to hurt. Now that, and, and really hurt. And I wasn't familiar in those times of feeling hurt in my heart. And you can understand why a kid can't really tolerate much hurt like that. So instead, frustration came up. And as I was kind of going, this seems kind of tangential, right? I mean, we've got a railing that's not working very well, and I'm back feeling the helplessness of parents that were not as attuned to the yard as I was. And, and I'm watching my beautiful yard turn to, you know, 10-inch grass and not looking so great. And you know how grass then gets yellow at the bottom and, oh. <laughs> Plus, I'm not feeling heard or that I'm important, like am I a nobody here? I do the yard every week, and why isn't someone jumping to it? Let's get that mower fixed. (laughs) But as I looked at it, I called the contractor several times and said, I really think we need to rethink the, the plan on this stairway, it's just not working. Never called me back, just sent another crew. And I'm thinking, oh, so I don't feel like I matter. I don't feel like what I do has any purpose. And I, and I just sat there with my heart and with that young boy and said, I'm so sorry I had to go through that. I must have sat with him for like 20 minutes. And then I, it just occurred to me, oh, I'm going to call the contractor again. He didn't pick up. But I could feel the different tone in my voice. You know, I wasn't so irritated. I was more, hey, You're paying these guys. It's really not working. We need to get together. We'll see what happens this next week. I I encourage you not to hold your breath. (laughs) I tell Stuart, I think we should move out of the mountains because this is driving me nuts. (laughs) It's contractor mentality in the mountains. So breathing. 
Remind yourself to breathe. Remember that when you're triggered, you're never breathing. Isn't that interesting? Like when we're triggered, we have a very shallow breath. Sometimes we're holding our breath. Why is that? Because breath confuses the ego. Oxygen stirs things up. It doesn't like to be stirred up. You can feel disoriented if you do a lot of breath work. So breathe. You want that ego a little bit disrupted. <laughs> and then let's talk about meditation. We talk a lot about meditation, right? And for years, I fell into the trap of thinking you had to do meditation perfectly. And that meant controlling your thoughts. You're always supposed to be right on you know, the, the focus of your breath, or you're supposed to not have any thoughts at all. Or, and it was, a, pardon me, but shit show. <laughs> it was a mess. Because what I didn't understand was that meditation is about really allowing what is happening without getting attached to it without getting knocked over by it. Here's a, another great quote, I think. Oh, shoot. Oh, here it is. The object of meditation isn't to change ourselves, to throw out the old and bring in the new. It's about making friends with ourselves, meeting each and every part of ourselves with curiosity and compassion. This doesn't mean simply that we must tolerate the difficult stuff that comes up in meditation. It means that we have to explore it in order to become deeply familiar with our inner world. So what that looks like to me now is when something comes up, I allow it to come up. And if it catches me, then I celebrate when I wake up from the catch. Have you ever felt like you were 50 miles down the road in your meditation thinking about the grocery list or whatever else you have to, or your boss being angry at you or whatever it is? So you just come back. Oh, that caught me. I might want to you know, inquire into why that caught me, but for now I'm back. And to celebrate that you're back, you're back in the moment. You can feel your butt in the chair. You can feel your feet on the ground. It's again a process of coming back to the moment. And remember, all power is held in the moment. So see if you can't, if you're one of those people that's going, oh, I can't meditate. Well, try it again tomorrow morning, just for five minutes. And watch. Don't try and manage it, don't try and control it. Just watch what's happening in your meditation. Now, notice that in that quote, it said, you know, you don't just have to suffer through it. One of the things that we're going to discover through this process is that there are a lot of hurts, there are a lot of unsolved things in our consciousness, and you can get the impression that you just have to stick with it because there must be some kind of learning there, right? And there is, like let me give the example of a student I had years ago. She had a boss that yelled at her, not all the time, but freely yelled at her. And it was great because she came from a family that yelled at her and it brought it right back up in her face to look at the impact of it, which it had quite a negative impact on her, it really destroyed a lot of self-confidence in her. But that began to heal, and there was a, a certain confidence that was rising in her, right? And I loved it when one day she said, you know, he yelled at me the other day, and I'm not finding anything new to explore about it. <laughs> That's a key point, right? So I'm going to look for a new job. Now, this is the key. You have to stay long enough to get the gift of it, right? How many of us go, I'm out of there. That bastard, he yelled at me. Well, if you're having a reaction, you want to look into the reaction because you're not resting. You're reacting. You're not breathing deeply. It's shallow. And we want to be free. We want to be open-hearted. 
free so that what life presents to us, we can claim. But if we're just running from what triggers our hurts and our woundedness and our insecurities, then we're getting nowhere. One last thing. Oh, shoot. Maybe not. <laughs> what say you, Anne, keeper of the time? <laughs> I just want to say one last thing that I found incredibly powerful in this section. It's about courageous, pre courageous presence. And of course, if you've done any work like this, you know that it takes courage. Like, for example, uh, when I paused and found my hurting heart, it's not comfortable to sit with a hurting heart. And yet, it's tolerable. And I recognize that there was a kid in there that never had anyone to sit with him. He never even told anyone he had a hurting heart, you know, back in those days. Like, I love the fact that kids tell us that now. My heart hurts. So... Frank tells a story that I think is so much bigger than our own internal process. It's about a, a couple who has another couple over. They both have young boys, maybe like four or five year old, probably five or six year olds. And at one point, the wife says, where are the boys? And the husband says, oh, I'm sure they're fine. You know, just relax. But then one of the boys comes running up. And the mother charges out in the front yard, and her son has been hit by a hit-and-run driver. And he dies that evening. And, you know, you can imagine, well, maybe you, I, can we even imagine, unless you've been through that, but the heartache and the anger and the beating yourself up, right? Because she had this sense that she should go check and didn't. So the next day, she's all in that when the doorbell rings. And it is the guy that hit her child, hit her son. They don't go into the details, but I'm imagining that he saw it on the news or he read it in the paper because he came and he said, I had no idea I hit anything. I was distracted. I was running off to my daughter's rehearsal dinner for her wedding. And I am so sorry, beyond sorry, for what's happened. And it's fascinating. So this is where the courage is. One, can you imagine the courage it took to show up at her door, right? But the other thing is that she would, see, the ego wants to make it black and white. Either it's all my fault or it's all your fault. So, there was some of this beating up in her. I really should have gone and checked on the boys. When he apologized and she could feel the authentic nature of it, her anger melted in that moment. You know, she said that there were plenty of other angry moments later, but that's part of grief. But it melted, and in the courageous heart, in the courageous presence, she was able to come to a center place where she went, you know, you have responsibility and I have responsibility. And from there, she reported to Frank that she was able to move on with her life, that she came to some kind of resolution that was more heart-centered than on the surface saying life is bad or blah, 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 right? So what, what does this resting have to do with anything, really, when you think about it? And as I contemplated that, what I got to see was actually learning how to rest is brilliant for us. Because in our busyness, we're really covering things up deep inside of us. And if we're going to take it on, and not effort through trying to rest, but really take it on and allow ourselves to understand why it's so hard for us to rest, we are also going to get deep into what limits us, our hurts, our feelings of insecurity, 
the messages, that, the judgments and the messages that go on in our heads. And it frees us up to claim whatever the beauty of the moment is offering us, which will be fresh and new and alive. And when death comes to take us, death will find us very much alive.